joining us now is Seth Andrews. He is a well-known voice within the atheist community and author of the books The Converted and Sacred Cows. He's most widely recognized as the creator and host of The Thinking Atheist, which I know many people will feel is a bit of an oxymoron. The Thinking Atheist offers an online community, podcast, YouTube channel, and can be found at thethinkingatheist.com. Seth, it's great to have you joining us tonight. That's a pleasure to be here. It's funny because... Um... Many religious people think it's an oxymoron, and a lot of atheists mistakenly think it's redundant. Well, if you're an atheist, you're automatically a thinker. And, of course, I'm like, no, that's not true at all. Uh, I always like to clarify as well that I'm not the thinking atheist. Thinking atheist is not a single person. It's an icon that sort of reminds everyone that we reject faith and want to embrace reason and the evidence when determining what is true. And that's what the thinking atheist is all about. Absolutely. Well, um, I, I, we kind of brushed on this a minute ago, but you, your your story is a bit personal to me. Um, I grew up in the midst of the Bible Belt in rural North Carolina uh, to a family of independent Baptists. So for people who aren't familiar with independent Baptists, if, if you look at Southern Baptists and think that they're too liberal, you want to go with independent Baptists. And I was at a Bible study one night, and after the Bible study was over, this guy made this comment that he said something to the effect of, have you seen this video? Like, can you believe that there are people who actually are out there thinking like this? And lo and behold, it was a Seth Andrews video. And so I went home and I watched that video, and then I watched the next video and the next video. And over the course of a few weeks, I began to see cracks in kind of the fate that I had built up for so many years. So I kind of credit you for um, almost giving me a sense of enlightenment. And as uh, like, as planted in the religion as I was, you had it more so because it was your career. Um, I know that your parents were very religious, um, actually did scholar work. Yeah, that's true. My mother wrote a Greek New Testament study guide used at the college level. Of course, this was many decades ago. I don't know if the, the book is still used, but she still teaches at the age of 80. She still teaches New Testament Greek. Uh, both of my parents are and consider themselves theologian level believers. They're, they're hardcore. They honeymooned in Jerusalem. Uh, wow. They met at Oral Roberts University. You know, there is no casual Christianity at their home. It was very hardcore. So, uh, so kind of take us back um, to your, your your beginning years in Christianity, and what was kind of the change that made you personally see that um, there were there were cracks in that kind of foundation? What led you to be becoming an atheist? Well, you know, I, I was talking to somebody just the other day, and I told them if I could go back in time and talk to my younger self, fifteen years ago, even you know, not just being a kid, teenager, young, twenty something, but you know, if I could go back fifteen years. And tell them I would be here now, I mean, I can guarantee I'd never believe it. It didn't seem possible. But, you know, I was raised in the cradle of the faith. We had uh, church and vacation Bible school and Christian school and Christian music and Christian everything. And uh, there was no question in our minds. We had no choice, really. I mean, there, God is real. The Bible is true. Jesus is coming again. And um, we were sort of groomed as young people to grow up and have families of our own and have Christian children and and make a Christian impact in the world. I was a Christian radio host from 1990 to 2002, approximately. Uh, played Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, Stephen Curtis oh, yeah. Chapman, those types of artists, you know. Absolutely. And I remember, you know, my parents were so proud. They, they, our son is in the ministry. He's helping to spread the gospel through music. And he's a broadcaster. Thousands of people know his name. And they, you know, they're busting a button. They were so excited and happy. And, and there were a couple of major events and about a thousand small ones that just didn't jive. I, I, and I came to this point where things just weren't always connecting. I felt like, you know, it was human beings who were sort of fabricating and molding God into whatever image we needed him to be, you know. If a child recovers from cancer after chemo, it's, you know, it's God. If a child dies due to cancer, then God called the child home to be an angel or, you know, whatever. Uh, if, you know, somebody recovered from a car wreck, we didn't thank the paramedics. We thanked God. If they were killed, we said God called them home, you know. Um, 
there was an accident which took the life of a major Christian singer named Rich Mullins. It was charged to me and my co-host to go on the radio and tell everybody that God called him home. And it just made no sense, you know. And um, 9-11 was big for me and a whole bunch of just oh, yeah. small things. So I just these this death by a thousand cuts until finally I just sort of began to withdraw and I just operated on the outer membrane of the faith. I didn't go to church. I didn't pray. I didn't practice in Christianity in any meaningful way. I just was the guy who if you asked me if I believed in God and I was a Christian, I said, well, of course. Right. And, um, you know, I don't know what it is about getting older, but in my own life, I just became less tolerant with not knowing with everybody telling me that, you know, I don't deserve to know or I'm not worthy of knowing or, you know, I, why would the questions be so much of a problem? Why are they such a threat? Maybe I should, let's, let's take this journey. And to make a very long story very, very short or much shorter, I was browsing the internet one day and I stumbled across a video by Christopher Hitchens. It was a debate video. And I thought, well, this will be fascinating. You know, the religious guy, the rabbi, is going to kick his butt. I wasn't even a Jewish, right? The rabbi is going <laughs> to kick his ass. And at the end of the debate, you know, Hitchens just mopped the floor with him. And I was just stunned. I sat there. I was at the office. I just sat there and I was just like, you know, he, what, he, he made sense. You know, atheists aren't supposed to make sense. He seemed like a moral person. Well, that didn't jive. He, so I started Googling and YouTubing Hitchens, which is how I found Dawkins and Harris and Dennett, you know, the Four Horsemen and all these other resources. I started reading books. And before I knew it, you know, uh, I was I realized in 2008 that I was an atheist and I said the words out loud. Yeah, so, yeah. so how was that with with your with you having such roots in your family, your friends, your career? What was that like when you had to break that news and how did they react well, it was tough. You know, I, you know, it's a hard thing. It, you know, I work for employers. They're devout believers. 80% of our church or clientele, they were churches at the office. I was a video producer in 2000, in the time 2007 and 8 and, and 9. And, and I remember thinking, you know, what's going to happen? They're going to find a, an excuse to get rid of me. What are mom and dad going to say? Um I had, uh, you know, I had real concerns. And so with my parents, I started with questions. And uh, this was near the beginning of my journey, right? They're theologians. They're yeah. supposedly the experts. And they kind of set themselves up as the experts in our eyes. You know, the whole family was taught that we go to them, the wise old man and woman, for answers. So I started to ask harder questions. I just started with questions. And the minute I started to ask they, I think, saw that there was a problem. Hey, wait a minute. Someone's not towing the line. Someone's not accepting it on faith. Somebody's starting to doubt. Doubt's a problem in the faith. And um, so then they would answer my questions, and the answers made no sense. They were totally unsatisfying. So I'd ask more questions, mm -hmm. and they would send back more answers, and it just got more and more and more. And before you knew it, they realized there was, you know, I had left the uh, you know I'd gone off their rails and started to carve a path of my own. I said the word atheist to my mother for the first time in 2008. I think it was November. It was a phone call and it was awful. It was terrible. She was crying and she was like, "You're not an atheist, son. You're you know you you're just you have doubts. You're in a valley. We've all been there. We've all been in a time in our lives when we're, our faith is challenged. And I I know that, you, but you're not an atheist. And I'm like, Mom, I don't believe." In gods, any god, any I'm an atheist. No, you're not. Don't say that word. It was horrible, you know. And uh, it's been ten long years of, you know, back and forth. It we at this moment don't have a relationship because I am an atheist activist, and uh, you know, I'm I'm sorry to say that, but they see me as the prodigal who did not return home, oh. and who is leading other people to hell, and so. While they say the words of love on the surface, true acceptance is not there. And because of that, we we don't really talk. Ooh, that's good. Do you, do you find now, with that being the outcome, that ultimately your, your journey so far, you would say, is worth it? I mean, is it worth? Oh, yeah. Look, you know, I'd, I'd never go back to the Matrix, right? Which pill yeah. do you take to go back? Red or blue? I can't remember which pill you take to go back to the Matrix. But, you know, honestly, it just... 
like my parents' faith doesn't irritate me. It doesn't make me angry. I mean, I get angry about the damage religion does, but they have the right to believe whatever they want to believe. Sure. Um, what frustrates me is that they feel that I must be fixed at all costs. And so, you know, off and on, you know, our relationships had its ebb and flows. You know, they they can't help themselves. It's, a, you know, it would be a text with verses and condemnations and warnings about hell. And it'd be a long email and we'd see each other at a family gathering and we were at one, I, I guess I can tell you the story, but my mother had received a birthday card from someone else in the family and the card was a beautiful card and it says, I thank God for you. And right there at the table, mom looks at me and says, do you thank God for me, Seth? You know, just that Ooh. sort of biting thing. Ooh. It's just nonstop, you know. It's, it's a lack of acceptance. They are denying me the right to carve my own path, to live my own life, and to pursue truth on my own terms. And and while we can disagree all day, great, you know, we should be able to occupy the same space. Sure. And so uh, our division is really not about faith and, and atheism. It's about boundaries. I believe, you know, they think that because they are mom and dad, that they have a right, they're charged to interject themselves into my life all the time to tell me how screwed up I am so that I'll turn. And I warned them, you know, look, you. I've, I've heard you. You've made your case over the course of years. We've had all these discussions, but um, uh, it's, you know, it's you don't have permission to do this anymore. And if you do it again, I have no choice but to pull the plug. So I blocked my mother and father. They're not even allowed to. Could they? They've lost their phone privileges. <laughs> you know. Oh wow. And, and I, you know, I think uh, we'll see each other probably at uh, a holiday gathering, and there'll be an uneasy piece between us on the surface. But uh, that's got to be awkward. Yeah, you know, it's it's hard. You know, you can see the yeah, disappointment absolutely. in their faces. You know, they they I was the guy who was playing Amy Grant, Stephen Curtis Chapman, and was you know Bible songs and Bible this and God that and Jesus this, and, and uh, they went from being proud of me beyond measure to ashamed of me beyond measure and they blame themselves they think we well, you know if only we'd done this and taken it to church more and prayed more and showed you the love of jesus then you oh. wouldn't be yeah and it's pretty you know it's 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 nothing i would wish on anybody but you know I'd, look it could be worse right i could live in freaking saudi arabia and be an apostate i'm doing all right you know it pisses yeah. me off uh of course but it, it motivates me it's to help make this journey perhaps easier for other people who might be going through the same thing. You know, they they deny themselves permission to live their own lives on their terms because they have this guilt that they've let mom and dad down. And I think they got to get over that. Absolutely. Uh, Steve, you were, um, you're going to ask something there. Yeah, let me, ask, let me ask Seth if I can. Sure. Uh, you, you know, you, you were talking about how you were immersed in the, in the whole uh, Christian upbringing what was that a bible literalist type of situation was that a younger creationist type of situation or are they just more evangelical but not necessarily those the same type of people that that accept uh the noah's ark and the global flood and those kind of uh christians we never spoke about young earth creationism we never did like any math as far as when the flood happened but we knew the flood happened uh yes absolute biblical literalism there was uh, you know, in the beginning, uh, God created everything. Adam and Eve were in the garden. They were tempted by the serpent. They fell. Humankind's contaminated. Noah built the ark. We believe the stories of, you know, Zacchaeus and Samson and Esther and and uh, Job. And, and we believed in the literal walking of the earth by a literal Jesus and his crucifixion and resurrection. We believed that Jesus was coming again and that we were all going to go to heaven. We believed in a literal heaven and hell. It was very literal. My father was more conservative. He came out of the Lutheran church. Mom was Pentecostal. So, you know, she believed in speaking in tongues and all that. And then I went to a Baptist school. So I sort of got Baskin Robbins, 31 oh, wow. flavors. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of Robbins everything there. Christianity, got, right? got to dip my toe into all of it. I never spoke in tongues. That was never my thing. But I got to see it happen. So. That's, that's another experience, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I got, I got a lot of that in my family, too. I'm a little mix of everything. I was I was baptized Mormon. My brother was Jehovah Witness. My mom's Jewish. My dad's my dad was a 
Protestant. My my other parts of my family have, have Lutheran. I've got yeah. Pentecostal. It's like just na name a flavor you want. I'll get, throw you to a cousin that actually you know is part of that denomination. So I definitely it's understand. weird. You know, for the God who's not the author of confusion, knowing there are thousands of denominations, conflicting denominations of the churches yes. that follow him, it just makes no sense to me. And they all think they're that right. That was always my thing because people they they argue over whether you should sprinkle. Whether you should dunk, and I, as, as I kind of evolved, I was that was my one sticking point was how can somebody who claims to love all of his children and you know we're supposed to worship this deity, but he can't leave you know just simple instructions, you know just white and black. This is you're supposed to dunk them, you're supposed to sprinkle them. It it, it made no sense to me. It was the most confusing thing, and I can't believe looking back that for the longest time. I didn't ask questions. That's the yeah. first step, I think, is to just ask, why is this like this? And I think so many Christians just don't do that. They just accept. You know, it's, that's what just one point that the Protestant church divides over. It's put 50 apologists in the room, and they'll argue about, should you sprinkle? Should it be oil or water? Do you immerse? Uh, is... Do you get the Holy Spirit at salvation, or is that a separate prayer after you accept Jesus? Is hell a literal place of fire and damnation, or is hell separation from God, or is it the grave, annihilation? You know, all, I mean, these are supposedly the basics. Is salvation forever, or is it temporary? Can you lose your salvation? And, you know, they just chew each other to ribbons over the basics, and the idea that God would require apologists, meaning that God would entrust his perfect message to the same human beings that screwed up everything else on the planet, <laughs> makes Very no good point. sense. And, uh, you know, it, it always amuses me when I see apologists on, you know, doing their tours and whatnot to explain God to the rest of us, to explain the book that should need no explanation. I mean, they are a, they are a self-refutation. They refute their own existence just by showing up. That's such a valid. Uh, that's such a good point. Now, on, kind of on that same point, when you started your your channel and you started uh, becoming more of an, an activist for atheism, from that point until now, do you think that the climate has changed any? Like, uh, is atheism gaining traction? Is there at least, you know, kind of the, the stereotype, I guess, of atheism going down? Because you're in the midst of it all the time. So, what do you think the climate's like between then and now? It's beca slowly becoming more normalized is the word we like to use, you know? I mean, we're seeing more and more high-profile people like Ricky Gervais and others who come out and, you know, Bill Maher, and they they just say, you know, it's all a bunch of crap, and they say it pretty boldly. Um, we're seeing the rise of uh, atheists statistically, especially in the 30 and under crowd, we're seeing the rise of the nuns, the non-religious they are none uh doesn't mean they're necessarily atheists but it means that they they don't participate in religious operations they don't need church they don't need the edicts of the church you know they are gay or they've got gay friends they're not interested in judging those people um they care about the world and you know they're not they don't care at all whether or not the book of revelation talks about this or that or whether Israel's supposed to do this or that in the end times i mean they're living more and more in the now you know um so th they're also much more inclined or at least able to fact check the stuff that comes off the church platforms thanks to the internet it's a minefield but i mean back in the old day if a pastor said something we'd be like hmm you know well okay now, if a pastor says something, you, you jump on Google and find a reputable resource and actually find out if, you know, there is evidence for a global flood or, you know, any of these types of things. And you can debunk the bad stuff pretty, pretty quickly. And so we're seeing this, you know, and the, the evangelicals are panicking. I mean, watch them. Their voices are more frantic. They're saying crazier stuff. Uh, which oh, yeah. is saying something. I mean, but to say Pat Robertson is even crazier now than he was, that's saying something. He's, he's always been kind of wild. Yeah, but he, he, he just recently actually, actually said younger creationists are crazy. So he's, uh, he's actually got to the point where even he thinks they've gone into extreme. But, and you're seeing the, the fundamentalist churches starting to wane as we get into what's called more of a seeker-friendly, the Joel Osteen stuff. It's where they just sort of Tony Robbins their way through a sermon talking about, that, you know, be happy, you can be somebody. Prosperity you know, gospel. Stay positive. It's really more of a rah-rah thing right. that doesn't do a ton of, of scripture, and it stays away from a lot of the fundamentals 
of Christianity. And and the church has had to evolve. David Fitzgerald is an author and friend, and he said, you know, if you want proof of evolution, just look at Christianity. It's had to evolve <laughs> to fit the times just That's to awesome. survive, you know, sure. generation to generation. Why, why, why do you think it is that um, with, like you said, the, the rise of the Internet, technology and information is right there at your fingertips – what do you think it is that that people just can't let go of? Like, why are there some people, you know, like us, who can kind of come to the light and see that this is a total farce? But then you have those people who just will not let go, no matter how many times it's uh, been proven false, no matter the evidence, they just will not let go of that 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 religion. Well, I think there, you know, people believe for a thousand reasons. I mean, I, I some people they just assume and and uh, it makes them happy, and so stirring that pot, you know, upsetting the apple cart for them is, you know, it's not a pleasant feeling to do. They don't, they want an absence of conflict and the idea of God in heaven and all these things, seeing their parents and best friend and family dog again in heaven, you know, these give them comfort. So there's comfort mechanisms. Other people, I think, use religion to excuse bigotry against other people. They enjoy the feeling of superiority by declaring they have the answer while so many other billions are deceived. Uh, I think there are many who are guilted and shamed by their families and cultures into acceptance of this faith, and they fear hell. I get a lot of emails from people. They're terrified. Even after they logically know that it doesn't make any sense and there's no evidence for any God, they still lose sleep. They have nightmares about burning forever in hell and childhood indoctrination. You know, there's a lot of, of reasons that people believe there's a misconception that religious people are stupid um brain damaged all this stuff that i see thrown out and that's just that's not that's not true there are a lot of extremely intelligent people who also have a god belief it just shows the compartmentalization of the brain the modular nature of the brain uh many people outsmart themselves they're so clever that they can sort of uh, find a way for the nonsensical to make sense by constructing a narrative all around it. Um, you know, and a lot of religious people are honestly wonderful people. They're beautiful people who love their families and want the world to be a better place. They're hamstrung, I think, sometimes by bad ideas. But, you know, they can be, in many cases, can be reached. And I think one of the first ways to do so is not to show up with a baseball bat with Hitchens quotes on them, and beat him over the head and say, you're an idiot for believing in God, Santa Claus for... I used to be that guy, you know? This is Santa it does, Claus it doesn't for work. Adults. It doesn't work. And and I, I think it actually has the op opposite effect. It has yeah. the, the backfire effect. But, but let me ask you, when it came to the nuns, how do you feel about that particular sect? For example, like Kyle, he's an out atheist. I'm agnostic, but I'm agnostic purely for epistemic reasons. But I agree wholeheartedly in everything you've been saying so far. I do accept you know, creation of them's crap. Um, I don't buy in any of the, the narrative that there's a literal hell or anything like that. Uh, but when somebody like myself, who, if, if I'm not an atheist, for, like I said, are you okay well, if, with if that? you're agnostic, how are you not an atheist? Like if you don't know there's a God, then you don't have a God belief. Right, because I don't use the colloquial definitions for atheism that American atheism uses. I use the Stanford Encyclopedia definition, which is basically somebody who believes that ontologically there are no gods in the universe or that the proposition of theism is false. So I use a very formal senso stricto definition approach to the term atheism, which, which not, I don't get. Yeah, I've, I've tried to explain it to him a few times. And I don't uh, I think, but it I doesn't think have to use it. I mean, I'm so, I, it's just my take is I right. agree. I, I, and I, I agree. know that I know that the, this narrative they put out that agnostics are fond of atheism, but unfortunately, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not here to challenge you. Can, you can brand yourself any way you want. That's fine with me. But uh, I'm just well, curious. That's, about, that's why I was kind of curious. If I mean, are you? Okay, I mean, do you do you are you okay with somebody self-identifying with a particular position, or do you say, well, I I I'm, I think you're an atheist, which is fine. But would you would you call me an atheist if I said, you know what, I'm not an atheist? Um, would would you? Be okay with that and say, okay, I'll call you what your preferred label to be is. Yeah, yeah, I don't get hung up on, you know, there's some people who get hung up on atheist, agnostic. A lot. Uh, <laughs> I do uh, frequently. I don't, you know, uh, if if the label works for you, great. Um, we may disagree some on the semantics or on definitions or, or whatnot, but I mean, you, yeah, it's your life, it's your party. I did them, no skin off my teeth. Yeah, so I, I respect that approach because um, I've, I've dealt with a lot of people 
uh, that both on the theist and the atheist side that really want to push their positions onto other people at all cost. And again, I think that has the opposite effect because it's well, look, it turns no, no, me no, away when people no, do. Now, that. you know, if I'm if I'm sitting alone, you know, in my own thoughts, having a cup of coffee, I might think, hey, you know, Steve's an atheist. Sure, right. I'm, 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 <laughs> you know, well, I do it every day. Yeah, yeah Kyle does that every day. So I, I do yeah, it every day. Yeah, I, we, you don't we, know what we, I. We you go... don't want to know what I think of Kyle in my head. So. <laughs> I love you, Kyle. Yeah. I'm um, sorry. I think so, I cut you off. You were asking a question. Forgive me. So Seth, you've definitely made an impact um, in the atheist community with your shows, your podcast. Like I was saying earlier, with with me personally, and I know it's impacted many others um, throughout the not only the YouTube community, but your speak the speeches that you give, your books. Throughout all of that, what's been the highlight of this ride? Um, what, what what one thing sticks out to you that, that you just you never would think that this would ha ever happen to you? Honestly, most it, it sounds like a cop out, but most of the last you know nine years. I mean, you, you got to remember, I started the thinkingatheist.com anonymously. I didn't show my face for two years because I was still sort of navigating out, and and so I started this online thing as a way to connect with other people. Um, the radio show I started in 2010. Before that, didn't even realize that you could do internet radio. And uh, so it was nice to get back into the game and and to see it explode and grow and, and reach out and impact people in a positive way has been, I mean, it's been far beyond anything I ever dreamed. I, You know, to be able to meet some of the wonderful people that I've met, you know, I've interviewed Penn Jillette of Penn and Teller. Oh, my God, he's awesome. You know, to absolutely. Yeah. John Delancey, you know, I got a chance to interview him. I ran into him at the Reason Rally. And, of course, he's... He's been one of my favorites since Star Trek The Next Generation. So I'm trying not to be that guy. But I'm like, I love your work. You're amazing. You're fantastic. <laughs> um, you know, it's okay. Uh, be that guy. To meet uh, so many people who, you know, like Dawkins and whatnot, who've made a positive impact in my own life. But more than that, I, I just, you know, I got an email today from someone who, you know, they just happened upon a video or a podcast recently that, uh, reminded them that you know it's okay to be you whoever that is you know love who you love pursue what you want uh follow your own value system you are not required to to live inside somebody else's cookie cutter they may play that card but and it was that's kind of my thing is to remind people you know your life belongs to you and we have this short window this blip of existence don't waste it trying to keep everybody else comfortable all the time that's that's on them, you know, seize the day and be who you are at the volume you choose. And, and people hearing that will send me messages and say, wow, you know, I, I needed to hear that at this moment. And it just gives me goosebumps every time I read that. And that's probably one of the most gratifying things to know that there's someone out there who, you know, their life might have, their course of their life might have been positively affected by something that came out of this show. You know, I'm not a great mind. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not even an ex-theologian, I'm just a guy who does this. I'm an ex-broadcaster, a storyteller, communicator, friend, you know, and uh, the fact that anything that came out of my channel could be, a, you know, a, an instrument like that in their lives just blows my mind. That's got to feel good. I mean, that yeah. that whole thing was just very beautifully said, and I mean, that's just got to be a testament to what you're doing. Thank you. Very kind. So, um, if, if let's say that there's somebody out there listening to this and they are kind of in the situation that we were in at one point where we're seeing the the cracks and they're feeling doubt but they just don't know how to um, make that vocal or to tell the people that that they love they don't want to hurt them in that sense what advice would you kind of give to them about embracing that doubt and, and not hiding you know, I'm going to try to make this a short answer, but there's a couple of layers. There's a few layers to this onion, so be patient. You know, flag me Absolutely. if I start to wander no, off into the weeds. Please, please. Um, the first thing is your journey needs to be about you. There are some people who beat themselves up because they, oh, I haven't told my parents. Uh, you know, my I have, my best friend doesn't know yet, and I feel like I'm a coward. And I, you just need to stop, you know, until you're ready, until you know you want to tell them. And, and you should hopefully come to a point want to come to a point when you can be free and open but you know don't punish yourself because because they don't know because now you're making your journey kind of about them and their reaction you know start with you the second thing is is that um 
in the church, doubt was always considered a problem, right? Doubt's either a sin, it's our weakness, or doubt is um, temptation, or doubt is an attack of Satan. You know, the idea that doubt was a positive was just crazy to us. It, it, even Jesus said, um, after Judas asked to see the nail holes in the spear hole after the he, the resurrection, you know, he, Jesus looked at Judas and he said, you know, you've seen and believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and believed, meaning that faith, take it on faith, just go with it. And uh, we reject faith. We think it's a lousy way. I mean, imagine if someone came to you and said, have faith in Allah and embrace Islam, you'd reject that. You know, think about doubt in another context. If someone came to you and they wanted to sell you a hundred dollar bottle of clear liquid that they said cured cancer, you would doubt that. And in doubting it, you would protect yourself from being scammed. If uh, someone wanted to pick up your child from the playground, a total stranger, and said, hey, come on in, your mom wants me to take you home, your child's doubt and suspicion and, and skepticism would be a positive because it saved them from potential harm or worse, death, you know? You know, doubt helps us to navigate what's true and what's not. And I think we need to stop with this idea that doubt is a problem. Now, doubt is a great mechanism for helping us to determine, is it true? Does it hold water? Go ahead and doubt. Embrace your doubts. Explore your doubts. Kick the tires. Do the homework. Do the internet searches. You know, buy the books. You know, evolve your own thinking. And always be prepared to acknowledge doubts. You know, I heard the bell of doubt in the back of my own skull for years before I did anything about it. About it. And honestly, doubt helps help me, set me free from from bad ideas. And at uh, the end of the day, wherever you land, it's your ch choice, it's your life to be lived on your terms. And everybody else, agree or disagree, should, even if they disagree with you, even if they hate what you think, they must observe boundaries. They do not have permission to step into your life and to shame you and to sort of shower negativity all over you. You know, you should surround yourself with family if you can, but family acts like family. And at the end of the day, it's on. It's up to you to decide where the boundaries are. And you have every right to say, you know, you cross this line and I'm going to have to live my life without you. I don't want that. But it's there are consequences. And, you know, you deserve that. That's something, uh, it's a right you should embrace for yourself. In my own life, I'd never go back to faith. I'd never go back to God belief. Uh, I don't love atheism. I just want to live a truthful life. And for me, atheism was the result. If we see evidence of a God tomorrow, I want to know that. And I think you would too. And we'll follow the evidence wherever it leads us. I think um, I, I think we could not end on a better note than than that. I think that was beautifully said. And Thank um, you. just the gospel, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think well, we're all doing what we can where we can, including you guys. So thank you for your efforts and your activism and for helping be a part of the conversation. And thanks for allowing me to play along. And we, we appreciate oh, it, immensely you coming yes. on. This was actually much better than I had anticipated. I knew a little bit about you going in. I didn't know much about your positions, but listening to you, I have to say, I'm very, very impressed by the way you, you handle these types of questions and what you're promoting Absolutely. as far as your activism. Um, I have I happen to agree with that type of activism. So you're very kind. Well, thank you for that. And uh, you know, I think we'll all just keep on keeping on and see if we can help to change the world. Got to. Well, Seth, it was a pleasure. Uh, thank you again for joining us, and um, have a good evening. Yeah, all right, you as well. You, thank you.